but I'll, I'll do my best as soon as we adjust again. All right. Well, my sermon today is entitled, I Have a Plan for You. And I really do believe that firmly in my heart, that God has a plan for each and every one of you. God, he's purposeful in his design. Everything we heard today in class, that there is order to the law of God. And there is order to the universe that he's put in place. And there is an order to the purpose that he has for you and me. Our opening text, we're going to read from that once again if you want to turn there. It's Jeremiah 29.11. Jeremiah 29.11. So we'll just give you a minute to turn there. In Jeremiah 29.11, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. I came in this morning and I introduced myself to a couple of people. And I said, well, yeah, Pastor Jeff was our pastor a couple years ago. Has it been about five years, maybe? Um, and the person responded, well, then you must have just been a boy. And so I appreciate those comments. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of a background on who I am. I've been here a couple times, maybe once or twice a year for the last three or four years. Um, so you may or may not remember seeing me. But I am a, a counselor by trade recently. Most recently, I work in a school. Uh, but historically, I've been a mental health counselor. And so... I like to remind us that God is a personal God. He is a God of relationships. Because when I interact with people in my office for the last several years, I see that there are many people that are missing the relationship with God. They have a pit where God needs to be. And they fill it with all kinds of things, whether it's staying busy or with substances or with maybe just family. Um, we fill our lives with all kinds of things. Um, and so that's a little bit of my background without going into a side sermon. Um, and for the last two years, I was the head elder um, of our church down in Nixa. Um, most recently, I've, I had stepped back from that because we had a baby. Um, and so that's been a new update since the last time I was here. We had a baby on March the 4th. And one of our, uh, our members at the church there, she says, Peggy Hunter... Uh, she says, well, a birthday like that, there's purpose in that. Because, see, my son, his name's August, his purpose is to march forth. Isn't that clever? She came up with that. So, born March 4th of this year, my son August. And it was just about seven, eight days into having this new little baby, and I had been home uh, with him as much time as I could, and I finally went back to have a meeting uh, with the school counselors there in the Springfield District. And as we gathered together, I received a call, and my wife was crying. I've had a couple chances to share this story, so I'm going to try to keep it together a little bit today. But there was tears in her voice, and I couldn't quite understand what she wanted to tell me. But she said, there's something wrong. Our baby, seven, eight years old, there was something wrong. And that whole week, everywhere I went, and everybody I had the opportunity to interact with, I had the chance to say, he's perfect. My baby is perfect. He is beautiful. I mean, he is a boy, but he is beautiful. He's perfect. And in my heart of hearts, that was my firm belief about my son, that God gave me this perfect baby. And then I got the call. He wasn't perfect. You see, they do these funny little tests. Um, if you've had a baby in the recent history, science, it flies by. Medical science, there's something new every day, I think. And my other son, he's eight. When he was born, he didn't have this test. But August, he's a new enough baby, uh, that they now do a little heel prick and they take a little blood sample and they scan that blood for all kinds of diseases and potential errors in the genetics. And what they found was he was diagnosed with a condition called Fabre's disease. 
most of you won't have ever heard of this. It, it's kind of one of those one in a you know, hundred thousand kind of situations. Um, but Fabray's disease is a disease that will alter his life forever. It, by all accounts, would cause ongoing pain as his body doesn't, or it would not have the, pro- the ability to process fats. And you might think as good Adventists, well, we have an answer for that. That's the health message. But apparently this is any fats. So just natural fats that your body produces. The diagnosis would say that he doesn't have the ability to process that. And so like gout, over the years, that will build up in his organs and in his extremities. It'll start with pain shooting through his hands and fingers, toes and legs, potentially incapacitating him at times during his young life. And then it will spread into his organs, and eventually he will die an early death of organ failure. And so that's where we were one week into our newborn. And so I got in my car, I left that meeting with the school counselors, and for a moment I just sat in silence. And then anger hit me. Why, God? Why would you do this to my perfect baby? You just gave me him. Why would you tear him into pieces? Why would you put him in a situation for the rest of his life that he will have pain and suffering and misery until he dies? A couple weeks later, we get another call. And actually, it wasn't a call. It was a doctor's appointment. And we were in the doctor's office. And the doctor said, well, we need to do some checking on the way his skull is lined up. And so they did some scans. And at six weeks old, they diagnosed him with another, and this time one in like 6,000 babies are born with this condition, craniocinetosis, which is basically his little skull, the midline has fused together. You know, baby skulls, they're supposed to be flexible, malleable. They're supposed to grow with the baby. His wouldn't do that side to side. And so now we have two conditions within the first month and a half. And I got to tell you, my faith was rocked. And I just kept, well, actually, I quit praying at some point in that journey. Because I don't know if you remember the story of the blind man on the road. And the disciples are asking about this blind man. They're talking to Jesus. And they say, who sinned? Was it the man's sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be blind? And that's about where I was. I was asking myself, what have I done? You know, you hear about the idea of, cursing to the third and fourth generation. That's kind of an Old Testament kind of concept that I've always kind of thought about in the, the idea that, oh, we understand how genetics work and how, you know, alcoholism and depression, it runs in families. So the, that made some sense to me. And here we are with a child that was perfect, I thought. And yet, whose sin is it? Whose sin is causing my baby to no longer be perfect? You see, I've tried to do the best I can. I've tried to serve in the church in the capacities that I can. As an elder, I've been a counselor for the last about eight years, trying to serve people, do the best that I can. I've, about the time Pastor Jeff moved down here, um, I had the opportunity to do my first speaking um, in front of people. I thought, I'm trying to serve. I'm trying to do what I know is right. And yet, I wondered about my pride. I wondered about my own sometimes inner thoughts about how I do things a certain way, and that's the right way to do it, and the way you do it, probably not so right. Because I can be a little judgmental, because day in and day out, I see the faults and the problem with people. And I wondered, is it the pride of sin that has cursed my baby? Is it my own stuff that has affected him? 
And I kept pulling further and further back, and I found excuses. Well, we need to stay home probably today with the baby. You know, he's little, and he's not quite ready to go to church. And they really do recommend for the two, first two months that a baby doesn't go out into public because, you know, there's all kinds of little germies and things out there. And so we had legitimate excuses to not be in church. And I found myself in the morning, evening, and noontime avoiding my prayers. And I didn't want to open this book. I didn't want anything to do with it. Because God had done this. Somewhere between me and God, something went wrong for him to do this to my family. My wife, I don't know, it was about probably a month before my son was born, she bought this little book. Just a simple little devotional book. It's called Jesus Today for Kids. She just went into Barnes & Noble and picked it up for my eight-year-old son. And the idea was we were going to read this in the evening as a part of our bedtime routine. Because we always have read to my son every night. And often it's, you know, the little story about the mouse, and he, he goes on the adventure, and he talks to the boy, and, you know, just silly, kind of fun little antics of childhood. And let me tell you, I kind of dug my heels in. I didn't want to pick up this either. I just wanted to read the fun little story of the mouse and the boy, and the adventures they would go on. I wasn't ready even to hit the child devotional. And finally, my wife, she just kept encouraging me. We really should read that. So I picked it up. Night number one, I read the first chapter. And these, I mean, you're talking a, a one-page entry. They are not long at all. And I begrudgingly read it. The chapter was called My Kind of Hope. Didn't even phase me. Didn't even register what it was about. Chapter 2, read it, just kept moving, just because it's kind of the duty of a dad. you got to read to your kid, right? Finally, day 3, came to this. I have a perfect plan for your life, but sometimes my plan might be different from yours. Sometimes it will involve doing something hard or uncomfortable, such as helping someone very different from you, or being a friend to someone who is lonely. At other times, my plan for you will include trouble and problems, not because I've stopped loving you. It's because I want you to learn to trust me as we face those troubles together. When you're going through tough times, you need me more than ever. When my plan for you is different from what you expected, you can choose to be angry with me, or you can choose to trust that I want only what is best for you, Hard days won't last forever. Keep believing and hoping. Then, at just the right time, I will lift you up. Until then, give me all your worries and trust that my plan is good for you. Because I love you. And it, it just poured over me and I cried. And I cried. Because God loves me. He loves you. It is not this world of sin that's fighting against God's plan for you that it is, it is this world that's fighting against God's plans for you. It's mired in sin. Back to the blind man on the road. And if you decide you want to read this later today, it comes from John 9. Do you know what Jesus told the disciples about that blind man? Whose sin was it? It was neither his sin or his family. When I found that, it was like this weight this whew, was lifted. All that guilt, all that persecution, self-persecution that I had for myself and I was blaming on God, neither sin caused this. He goes on, Jesus replied, this is verse 3, Jesus replied, neither have sinned, this was done to show the works of the Father. And so the first time I had the opportunity to share this was right around the time that we got this news. And 
if you've ever been to Springfield, you might remember Pastor Bob Cornelis, and he had sent me a message. He said, Gary, we really need somebody to preach in Kimberling City. And at the time, guess, guess what I did not want to do? There was no way I wanted to preach. I wasn't even reading my Bible. And he was just sending me this little text while my wife was encouraging me to read this little book. It's amazing how God sends little voices into your life to keep pushing you forward. If we really stopped and listened, probably he's speaking to you too. Neither have sinned. This was to show the works of the Father. And so from that point on, everywhere I have shared this, I have told them that I have claimed the promise of Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your calamity, plans for a future and a hope. And that's the promise that I'm claiming for my son, that his life will show the works of the Father. It doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. His life, what he goes through, is an opportunity for God's glory to be shown and seen. Do you understand that? But it gets better. I started reading my Bible again. And I found a couple spots that I really continued to use as encouragement as we went through this process. Psalms 32.10 is pretty good. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. You see, the only option that we have is to put our faith into the hand of Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can guide us through the tough times. It is only through his love, only through his mercy, that we can escape the pain and suffering of sin. And only, really when we receive life eternal. Paul puts it this way. Rejoice in hope, persevere in tribulation, be devoted in prayer. I really like that. Are you devoted in prayer? Because for a moment, I lost my prayer life. And boy, did it send me into a pit of misery, a pit deeper than Joseph was in for sure, because at least then somebody could toss him a rope. What's your rope when you're in that pit of despair? Often, when I picture the relationship you hopefully have with the Holy Spirit, I picture this rope descended from heaven, from the throne of God that is the Holy Spirit, and He is just asking for you to hold on. Hold on in faith, despite your misery, despite your pain, despite your diagnosis, because there is hope eternal in Jesus Christ. About a month ago, well, we're in, we're in August now, about two months ago, my son had a surgery. And so we were able to manage the situation, this craniosynostosis, the, the deformity of how the brain has, or not the brain, but the skull has fused together. And they were able to separate that. And he wears a funny little hat that keeps everything kind of aligned like your braces would align your teeth. He has no idea he's got this funny little hat. He loves it. In fact, when we take it off to take a, a bath or a shower, he kind of reaches up like, where's my hat? Loves it. Well, I don't know. He may not love it, but you wouldn't know he doesn't. Now, two months ago, or a month ago, sorry, I was asked to preach again. This time I was over in um, Nixa. The very next Monday, after sharing this sermon, we get a call from the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic had the geneticist that was looking at you know, I mean, just looking as close as they could at these chromosomes and trying to identify what specifically is wrong and how will that affect his long-term care. That was where they were at. The doctors wanted to figure out what is our treatment plan for managing lifelong symptoms. The geneticist calls, tells my wife, well, tells the pediatrician who tells my wife, there is no disease. Do we serve a good God? 
I am telling you, we live in an age that you may not feel like you see miracles every day, but they're there. Some people might say, well, they got the test wrong the first time. I don't care. Because my God loved me enough to make that miracle happen. Where I went through the real despair, because for months and months we lived with the reality we were going to lose our new child. To the point that now we can share that Jesus loves you. He loves me. He loves my son enough that he will miraculously place his hand upon him and provide healing. And so though we have managed this, this surgery, which involved his skull, this lifelong altering disease that there was no cure for, that the doctors just wanted to help us plan for the future... We don't have that problem anymore. And I really do, you know, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Do you know what the rest of the story of the blind man on the road is? Do you remember what Jesus does next? I didn't have this in my original sermon. Because I didn't know that God was going to reach out and touch my son in such a miraculous kind of way. But do you know what the rest of that story is? Jesus kneels down. And you can almost imagine for a thoughtful moment, he looks at that dirt and he remembers creating you. And he takes his saliva into the dirt and he makes a paste, a clay, and the potter takes the clay and he remolds that man into a witness for his glory. You see, without the suffering that that man that had been born that way went through, he would never have the story to tell that Jesus touched me. He reached out with his hands and sculpted me into something new. And that's what he has done for my son. He has provided him the opportunity that his glory will be seen everywhere he goes. And I, I can't help, but this is the testimony that I have to share. It is real that God loves you, that your faith will get you through those times. Now, do I think everybody that has cancer is going to have a miraculous healing? No, I don't. Because we are in a world mired in sin. And the devil is a roaring lion out to get us. But man, you have got somebody in your corner that is willing to support you. That is willing to raise you up in tough times. Because your suffering, your diagnosis, your life-altering condition, your family situation, that suffering is an opportunity as Jesus put it, for the works of the Father to be seen. Everything you go through is an opportunity. Praise God when you suffer. Praise Him for the opportunity that you, like Him, that bore the cross on His back, placed a crown of thorns into His skin, suffered and died for you. You have the opportunity to suffer and live in this world a living testimony of Jesus' love for you and me. So I'm going to close with our opening text, because I think it's good to remember. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, plans for calamity, for not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Our ultimate future and our hope is the soon return of Jesus Christ. And if you can place your hope in that, it doesn't matter what you're going through. I get it. I get that life makes you pretty frail and miserable at times. I get it. When you go to your place of business, when you hang out with your friends, that people aren't always nice. I get it. But everything you go through is an opportunity for Jesus to be seen through you. Take the opportunity. You have purpose. In this community, this church has purpose. You are a peculiar people. You stand out. 
Seize your purpose and run with it. Don't just sit in the pew. Don't just find yourself glued to your seat. Get up and run the race. Our closing song today is Trust and Obey. It comes from 590 in your hymnal. Trust and Obey. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise your name for being a God that loves us in a real and personal way, that you are willing to reach out and reshape us into something with purpose. You are the potter. We just commit our lives into your hands that you just may mold us and shape us, Lord. Please, Lord, we just ask for your blessing as we leave this place, that the 
the sufferings and the difficulties that we go through on a daily basis that our families go through, that we can abide in faith with you, Lord, that we can trust and obey that you are righteous, that you have grace and mercy enough that is sufficient for all of us. And so love and mercy will guide us all the days of our lives, that we can be a living example, a light on a hill, Lord, for your glory to be seen. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, just recommit our lives to your purpose, to go out and make disciples, Lord. That is ultimately what the blind man did. He went out onto the roads, and even though his family wasn't prepared to stand up and say, yes, Jesus was the one that healed this man, the man, he knew, he went out, and he went everywhere he went. He praised your name. He shared the gospel story of your love in your holy name.